Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Alexandra Blevins, and I'm the Forest Health Specialist with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. So as you all know, we're focusing on invasive species awareness this week. And so I've been called in to uh, talk to you guys about the uh, exciting topic of insect invaders. So, you know, not only for my position is it super important to know about these insect invaders, but I think it's really important for the whole community of the Commonwealth of Kentucky to know just a little bit about these insect invaders because they can pose a deadly threat to our Kentucky woodlands. And this is exactly why we're going to focus in on this topic for today's discussion. So unfortunately, here in the state of Kentucky, we are up against an army. There is a whole slew of different types of insects that are ready to feast on your trees. So in this slide, I just wanted to go over a variety of different types of insects that you could potentially find in your woodlands. So to begin, we have here uh, the culprit that's known as the yellow poplar weevil. And as you can see, this uh, tiny little black insect here feeds and develops on yellow poplar tree foliage. Um, some people also call those tulip poplars. And this can sometimes be a problem out in eastern Kentucky. The next culprit that we have here is something that I see in northern Kentucky sometimes, and this is known as the locust leaf miner. And as you can see, it creates damage to this black locust leaf here by the juvenile creating these blotch mines that's um, demonstrated in this you know, brown blotchy spot on the foliage there. And uh, this can cause some outbreaks on occasion. And next, we have this little slimy critter that some people refer to as an oak slug, but this actually isn't an oak slug at all. It's uh, actually the scarlet oak sawfly. And we see these from time to time. And the juvenile of the insect, as you can see, um, da -da -da, if I can get technology to work with me, <laughs> uh, here, creating uh, the damage type that is known as skeletonization. So the juveniles will actually eat away at the leaf tissue of our red oaks and leave behind the veins. And so it kind of looks like the skeleton of what was once a leaf. And then over here, we have the hemlock woolly adelgid. And so you might have heard of the damage that this insect is causing in eastern Kentucky by attacking our eastern hemlock trees. And then one uh, that would make, I think, everyone really happy in the forest health world, um, if you knew about it, is the emerald ash borer. So as you can see here, this is a beautiful uh, jewel beetle, but it is a tree killer. And lastly, for the sake of the brevity of the presentation, our newest culprit is uh, the red bay ambrosia beetle that has joined this army that is uh, battling our trees here in the state of Kentucky. And so, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many more. And on this next slide, I think it's really important for us all to understand that we have both native forest pests and non-native forest pests here in the state of Kentucky. And there are some really major differences between these two insect groups that can help you to understand what you might be dealing with on your land. So uh, to jump right in, when we're talking about our native forest pests, such as this little guy up here, this fuzzy, cute little caterpillar, the eastern tent caterpillar, you may have noticed it munching away on your black cherry tree leaves. Um, or also making those kind of nuisance um, silken tents that they will create. Uh, so, you know, we get minor damages from this little caterpillar from year to year, but it's very minor in comparison to uh, when we delve into these exotic insect pests and their problems. And the other thing to note is that these occasional outbreaks from the eastern tent caterpillar and other native forest pests they will kind of ebb and flow from year to year. So maybe one year you're seeing a lot of damage from this little caterpillar, and then the next year you might see nothing at all. 
So it's a cyclical in nature. And then also, uh, such as this creepy crawly, it is a defoliator, so it's you know eating away at your tree's leaves. Um, so a lot of our native pests are also defoliators, or they're just causing little added stressors to the tree. They're not going to kill a tree outright. And so that is the major takeaway from this slide, I think. So with these native forest pests, our native tree species have been able to uh, you know, grow and co-evolve with these pests, and so they're better able to adapt to these types of damages. And lastly, these native uh, pest problems are very limited in scale and very patchy across our region, and they're lessened in their impacts, whereas when we talk about our non-native, exotic, or invasive species, all of these three terms will mean the same thing throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, these are what I like to call our heavy hitters. So they're causing the greatest amount of damage and the most amount of impacts in our region. And um, you know the major difference, they're going to lead to these mass mortalities, so a lot, a lot of tree death over the landscape and they have the potential for widespread distribution. And so the example that we have here uh, is the uh, gypsy moth caterpillar. And some of you might have heard of this caterpillar and the devastation that it's causing to a lot of our oak-dominated forests, uh, not here in Kentucky, but in some of our uh, eastern state counterparts. So we really don't want that bug here, so thankfully we don't have it. But all in all, these reasons and many, many more are why we are so focused on, uh, you know, tracking and trying to eradicate these exotic insect pests. So, you know, our trees don't have any natural defense system against these exotic pests and they're not supposed to be here, so how in the world did they get here? So, you know, we are living in modern times, people, so there might be commodities and goods that we want, but we can't get them here in the States. So they are brought over on cargo ships such as this across you know, the seas from other lands. And uh, as you can see, this is packed to the brim full of these shipping containers. And inside of those, you will get things like the wooden crates or wooden pallets. And you know, the common denominator with these uh, types of wood byproducts and shipping materials uh, you know, they're made of wood. So these forest pests, they need wood, obviously, to complete their uh, development and survive. So maybe, for instance, you might have a emerald ash borer that's uh, stowed away, so to speak, in that wooden crate. And when that arrives to port and that gets opened, and, you know, maybe it escapes onto the wild, and that's where the devastation begins. So the three major culprits here for the state of Kentucky that we're really going to hone in on the rest of the presentation uh, will be the emerald ash borer, the hemlock woolly adelgid, and the red bay ambrosia beetle. So to go ahead and jump into the content on the emerald ash borer, or EAB, as you can see, this is a most beautiful jewel beetle. It's got that beautiful emerald hue. But as I mentioned before, it's a tree killer and it's not supposed to be here and therefore our native ash species have no natural defense system against them. And so as its name implies, it's specializing on those ash species that we have here in the state of Kentucky where it's going to feed and develop underneath the bark of these trees and once it completes its development, the adult beetle will exit from the bark, leaving behind this perfect D-shaped exit hole that you can see right down here. So that's a key characteristic to look for in your ash trees. But how is this tiny little insect wreaking such havoc on these massive trees? Well, as you can see, it is actually the larval form of this insect. When uh, its feeding habit you creates this um, serpentine gallery where it's carving out the sap wood of these ash trees. And this is uh, the vehicle that moves water and nutrients throughout the tree. So if you have a massive aggregation or an infestation in a single tree, as you can see in this uh, tree here, uh, it 
the galleries will coalesce or conjoin and it will block off or girdle the entire flow of water and nutrients in that tree. And just like us, you know, if I go without food and water, I'm going to die. And so that is what we're seeing on our landscape is a lot of ash mortality. So exactly how bad is it? As you can see here in this map of the Kentucky EAB infested counties, it's pretty darn bad. Pretty much the eastern two-thirds portion of our state highlighted there in green. Uh, those are previous detections of EAB since uh, spanning from its discovery in 2009 till 2019. And then over towards the western portion of the state, those four blue highlighted counties, those are our uh, detections from just last year. And so what exactly is KDF doing about it and what can you do about it? So a major uh, part of my job, one of my uh, priorities, is to monitor or track the movement of these invasive pests throughout the Commonwealth. And then we report back to the public on these findings. And so that map is a great example of how we do that. So, uh, you know, I'm out there putting in the physical miles, whether it's on the ground or up in a plane, looking for those new areas of ash mortality due to this little critter. And uh, those four counties that were highlighted in blue, those represent Davies, Henderson, Monroe, and Muhlenberg. So we want you to know if you live in either of those four counties or the surrounding area, you could have a new threat knocking at your door. But it doesn't end with the survey work. Um, I also do a lot of technical assistance and uh, public outreach through different types of educational programs. And so if you follow this uh, link down here, it's a one-stop shop that will actually guide you how to treat your ash trees for EAB. And I get a lot of landowner phone calls, and this is one of the primary questions that I get is, can I treat my ash trees? So right at your fingertips, I would urge you to check that out if you haven't. All right, moving into the second major culprit of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So some of you might be scratching your head, a hemlock woolly what? What the heck is an adelgid? Well, you can think of an adelgid kind of like a much tinier version of your common garden aphid. And both of these insects will actually deploy the same tactic on this uh, highly magnified image, this little curly cue there. Um, that is the piercing sucking mouth part of this insect. And they will stick that into their host plant and literally suck the will to live out of these trees. So once again, the hemlock woolly adelgid is attacking our eastern hemlock trees, and it's another species from Asia. So once again, not supposed to be here. And that's why it's causing such dramatic damage on our landscape. So unfortunately, uh, for the majority of the year, this insect is so tiny <laughs> that you can't see it with the naked eye. So you know, as we saw this highly magnified image taken from under the microscope. And then if you have a really highly, uh, you know, powered camera lens, a very expensive camera, you are able to pick them up um, through that lens. Thank you to Kentucky Heartward for that. But that little black dot there with the white stripe, that is the adelgid for most of the year. But you can see uh, during the winter months, they will actually put on kind of like a winter coat like we would. They coat themselves in this white, woolly, uh, waxy secretion that makes them very easy to detect when you're out in the woods. As you can see on this branch that I'm holding up there, um, they will just basically sit there like lazy couch potatoes and suck the will to live out of this uh, hemlock branch. And eventually, those needles are going to defoliate. They're going to drop. And the sad situation with hemlocks is they don't refoliate. So they won't create any new uh, you know, needles to replace those. And that's why we see the sad situation um, in eastern Kentucky of all these dead hemlock snags. And so how bad is it? Once again, it's pretty darn bad with HWA. Uh, pretty much 98% of our native hemlock range has been uh, decimated and infested by the hemlock woolly adelgid. Although we do have a little glimmer of hope in uh, this little orange, or excuse me, yellow blob there in western Kentucky. This is a 
uh, isolated population of hemlocks around the Mammoth Cave area that is untouched by HWA, and we hope to keep it that way. So if you haven't seen a really beautiful, healthy, pristine hemlock, I'd highly urge you to get out there while you can. So once again, what is KDF doing about it, and how can you help? So we are actually using an integrated pest management approach. And the first step in that approach is uh, chemical control. And when we talk about an integrated pest management approach, that's just where we're trying to use every tactic available to us to battle this little bug. And so we're actually uh, out there, we have a small crew that's dedicated to this task of the chemical treatments, and they are out there hiking around uh, eastern Kentucky, up and down the mountainsides uh, with these uh, chemicals, and they're looking for the infested trees, and they will pour out that chemical, and it's systemic. So when they pour it in uh, the soil, it will be absorbed by that tree's roots, and move up through the trunk into the infested portion of the crown where the adelgid is, and the adelgid will suck that up with the sap, and it's going to kill them, and it's going to kill them for five to seven years. So it's a really effective technique. And then our second step that we are able to use comes to us in the form of biological control. So what, uh, we have what I like to call our little helpers. You can see here, uh, this is a predatory beetle. Uh, we use two species that are deployed in selected sites in hopes of creating a future field and sectory. And so these beetles, we can be very confident in uh, putting them out that they're not going to create another problem for us because they feed solely on HWA. So only HWA. Um, and it's a really neat program. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can follow the link there. And then lastly, uh, our newest addition to the realm of forest health problems in the state of Kentucky. We have laurel wilt disease, or LWD. So you might be saying, you haven't even mentioned laurel wilt disease throughout this entire presentation. Well, this is part of the insect and disease complex that's associated with that newest uh, soldier in the army, the red bay ambrosia beetle there. And so, um, that's a mouthful, an insect disease complex, but all you really need to know is that this little beetle, which you can see that tiny little black grain of rice there, um, that's the magnified image uh, under the microscope. And then, um, da, da, da. so up here on the dime head, just for a real life perspective, there's two of those little buggers on the dime head there. So very tiny insect, once again from Asia. But this beetle will actually carry with it a fungal pathogen that when um, it bores into a sassafras bowl, like on uh, this side over here, you can see it leaves behind these frass toothpicks that are littering this sassafras tree here. But when it bores in, it's inoculating the tree with the lethal part of this disease, which is the fungal pathogen. And so um, in this bottom image, you can see that dark staining in the sapwood, that is the fungal growth, and that is what is actually killing the tree, because just like with EAB, it is girdling the movement of water and nutrients in this sassafras, and that leads to uh, rapid wilt. So you'll see early fall coloration in these sassafras leaves, and they're kind of droopy and sad. Um, that is the early onset of wilt in this tree. So please pay attention and let us know if you're seeing anything like this in your woodlands. So I mentioned it's very, very new, but it's rapidly moving. So we just found it in 2019 in these three uh, highlighted counties across the Tennessee border, Christian, Todd, and Logan. And then just last year, we had a record setting seven new counties added in 2020. So uh, that just screams at me that we need all the help that we can get to track this disease. And so how can you help us? Um, you can see in this picture here, those kind of gnarly orange tipped branches, that is a dead sassafras. So that's how you can pick those out on the landscape. And then over here, these wilted rusty colored leaves, this is a sassafras that has started the onset of wilt. So if you're seeing anything like this, please let us know. 
And so, um, you know, once again, I'm out there putting in the miles, whether it's on the ground or up in a plane, looking for these types of damages. And just from last year, that resulted in Trigg, Simpson, Barron, Allen, Green, Hardin, and Jefferson being added to that map for Laurel Wilt disease. So once again, if you live in these areas or surrounding these counties, please be aware that you could have a new threat to your sassafras and spice bush. And so uh, not only are we putting in those miles, but we're also helping with research surrounding this disease because uh, you know it's so new that we're every, not only KDF, but everyone is trying to learn as much as they can about it as quickly as we can. So we help uh, professors at the University of Kentucky and scientists um, with the US Forest Service. And of course, educational out outreach always. And then these two slides, um, the, this one and the following, these are just some Kentucky proud moments. So Kentucky is actually the first and only state to have ever used aerial detection to find Laurel Wilt disease on the landscape. So these are some images that I had the pleasure of shooting from up in the plane. And as you can see in the sea of green there, there are those rusty colorations and that is the dead sassafras. And so Franklin and Horse Cave, those were actually uh, Simpson and Barron County detections that we added just last year. So we can use this as a tactic in the future to find uh, new locations of this disease. And then the second, maybe some of the largest news that you'll hear about today, uh, we have found the first ever infected spice bush in the wild for LWD. And so the same symptoms that you're seeing in uh, sassafras, you're also going to see that in spice bush. So in the middle, you have uh, the early fall coloration presented at the, as that golden yellow hue in the foliage of the spice bush. Then uh, you have the wilt, which will happen very rapidly after that. And then, uh, you know, that dark halo of staining in the sapwood. And then, of course, the very sad looking bowl with all the frass toothpicks hanging off of it. So report, report, report. I'd love to know about it if you're seeing anything remotely like this. And lastly, uh, I encourage everyone to be a part of the solution. Uh, so please help us out, help the Commonwealth out. Don't help these, uh, you know, pesky critters out because, you know, firewood is one of the main vehicles of how they get around once they're in the states. So I know you've probably heard it before, but I'll say it again. Uh, burn it where you buy it and please don't move your firewood. And to leave on a much, uh, hopefully, lighter note and happier note, here in the state of Kentucky, we have a national champion on our hands the largest in the nation, maybe even worldwide, sassafras in Owensboro, Kentucky. If you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's a marvelous sight to see. And we wanna keep this tree happy and healthy. So, um, you know, laurel wilt disease could impact this tree and we don't want that to happen. So please be a part of the solution. And with that, um, you know, I can talk your all's ear off all day about bugs or other things within the realm of forest health. Uh, so please feel free to give me a holler at my email or through phone. And um, if you have any concerns uh, or questions about what was presented today or maybe some other weird stuff that you might be seeing in your woodlands, uh, please reach out. I'm always happy to help. And thank you.